Today you're going to see the real, the complete Sylvanas of BFA. So, welcome back to my Sylvanas Deep Dive. This is going to be quite the episode. Sylvanas has made questionable decisions, but with the emotional and behavioral context established in our last episode, much of what she ends up doing does make sense. However, Blaze have communicated this in a scattershot manner through books, comics, cinematics, novellas, and even on occasion, the video game itself, which I've been playing with my HD 58Xs from today's sponsor, Drop.com formerly known as Mass Drop. These have a 4.8 star rating from 1,350 people, so that's a bit wild. They've sold 32,000 units and you'll get $25 off with my link. The 58Xs are a collaboration between Drop and the renowned Sennheiser, one that upgrades the legendary HD 580s, bringing you an extremely clean, detailed sound that will, if you've never used audiophile gear before, change how you hear music and bring game scenes alive. Really, the reviews do the talking here. 4.8 stars, 19 6% recommending to a friend. These are comfortable, adjustable, sweat-free, and they've got an open back design that grants you amazing soundstage, bringing your music to life. You essentially can't get a better audio experience for the money, making these an incredible jumping in point, and my link makes it even better, giving you $25 off. So, a massive thank you to Drop.com for supporting this video and supporting our team, and with that, let's get into the battle for Azeroth. In Before the Storm, Sylvanas makes it clear that she doesn't really want to be War Chief, mainly down to the visibility of the position. This further suggests that she does have darker ambitions, as we covered in episode 1. As we've established, when level-headed though, Sylvanas will always try to make the best of what she has, so she resolves to make use of the Horde. Now, Azerite changed things. Sylvanas knew this and decided to maintain mining operations against the wishes of the other Horde leaders, clearly drawing the Alliance's ire and giving her the technological upper hand. Both Sylvanas and Anduin actually touched the Azerite, with before for the storm making the implications far more clear than the 7.3.5 cinematics. Azerite temporarily heightens the mind, and in her case, Sylvana saw many plans at once, grand visions of the future, both of creation and destruction, and how those two things are more closely linked than you would think. It is possible that, whatever plan Sylvanas had, it became more extreme and ambitious after this moment, with the Azerite granting her a view of what was actually possible. Possible. Of course, though, the Azerite would only be heightening what was already in her mind, but it does give us a glimpse of what she would desire if she had the power to achieve it. Indeed, that's perhaps why she began to ruthlessly seek more and more power through this expansion. Finally, then, we have the failed reunion in Before the Storm, which Sylvanas actually uses to kill the Desolate Council and Kalia Menethil, while also blaming the Alliance and spreading the notion of them being untrustworthy amongst the Horde further increasing her grip on the population. Now, of course, she may have inadvertently created her successor there, and it's true that the event may have heightened her own insecurities by bringing up the loss of her family, by bringing that closer to home. But still, she, as Nathano suggests, was able to use the event to her advantage, even though it may have been at somewhat of a cost. Of course, the battle for Azeroth would soon begin, but not smoothly, as it was spread between two novellas, an animated short, and a quick questline that, without the novella's context, really did leave many people confused and even had some self-contradictory elements. So, Sylvanas set on war with the Alliance, enlisted Sarfang to aid her. Now, further to what was established in Before the Storm, she asked Sarfang how he would take Stormwind, and Sarfang's internal monologue says that it's basically such a stupid idea that he challenged her to Makara on the spot. Some clear foreshadowing. Now, Sarfang believes it not to be possible, as does Sylvanas, but she reveals that it was a trick question, that she was talking of strategy, not tactics, agreeing that Stormwind could not be taken, but that it is her final objective. In the process, revealing her ambitions to Sarfang, who is angry, not wanting his people to be thrown into yet another meat grinder. Sylvanas is, however, able to convince him that war is a good idea, that while there may be a peace, that the Dark Spear won't forget who drove them from their lands, that the Orcs won't forget their time in internment, that the humans won't forget the First and Second Wars, going on to say that even the humans hunt her people down like vermin, even though her people are themselves ex-humans. And Sarfang thought to himself, by the spirits she is called. 
But he found himself agreeing with her that they should plan this war. Sylvanus, likely knowing what the answer would be, asked Sarfang if Orgrimmar was as defendable as Stormwind. And Sarfang admits that it isn't. He thinks that an alliance siege against Orgrimmar would actually be successful. He tried to say that he doubted that Anduin would launch a surprise attack, but Sylvanus then brought up Gan Greymane, pointing out that Gan even launched a kill mission on her without Anduin's permission in Legion, that it lost the alliance vital resources, and that Gan had not been punished for doing so, and that basically he would always push the alliance towards war. And Sarfang had to agree. So, Sylvanas successfully convinced Sarfang, even though we now know that she, of course, had far darker ambitions. And with that, the two leaders got to planning. And first, they took stock of their strategic situation, knowing that their fleets for both sides were heavily damaged and they would be limited to major operations on their own continents. Sarfang himself came to the conclusion that they would have to take Darnassus. And after speaking that word, Sylvanas then pressed him further. Sarfang ultimately believed that they could take Darnassus. Sylvanas had, in fact, though, exploited Sarfang's character, and cleverly she let Sarfang himself come up with much of the plan. Sarfang was concerned that they just unite the alliance against them through that attack, but Sylvanas convinced him that the alliance would be divided, that the Night Elves would demand to recapture Teldrassil, while the Gilneans would uh, demand that instead the alliance protect their lands. Sarfang actually followed her prompts, saying that if Anduin tried to take the Undercity, that the Horde would have Darnassus held as hostage. They both agree that Anduin does not command the same respect as his father, and that they could divide and conquer the constituent alliance nations. So, the two of them work together, based on this, on a misinformation plan, because they know that Orgrimmar has been, like, just full of alliance spies, and they successfully mislead the alliance spies, leading to the alliance actually committing their forces to Silithus. Finding out that this plan worked, and that Taronda had planned to stay in Storm and for a time, Sarfang then successfully advocated for launching their attack early. Yeah, Sarfang really is ending up being quite hawkish here. And this all makes for interesting reading given what eventually would happen. What we see here is that Sylvanas is a capable leader. Now, while she clearly had much of this plan thought through in advance, she lets Sarfang work the plan out in front of her for himself, making it feel like the two of them were indeed working together. And what we do see here is that Sylvanas is a cold, calculating, and logical character, but only when she is not under threat. All of her later controversial decisions take place when she's under duress, yet here, on her own territory where she's feeling safe, she is able to think clearly and plan well. I think this is Sylvanas at her best, and if she was like this at all times, I think the war would have played out quite differently indeed. And given what will soon happen, well, this quote I think makes my point crystal clear. We can divide the alliance only if the war to conquer Darnassus does not unite them against us. That only happens if the Horde wins an honorable victory, and I am not blind. The Horde does not trust me to wage war that way. That is what Sylvanas herself said. Nathanos later suggested bringing the new Blight. Sarfang, of course, shot the idea down, as did Sylvanas, who said, The Alliance would never believe we would use it. It is unthinkable, wiping out an entire city like that. A bluff with no teeth. Yeah. This is said by the same character who later wiped out that city, and because this all happens in the same novella, this reveals with great clarity just that she acts differently when under pressure, and we'll see later on. So, throughout this, uh, a good war makes it clear that Sylvanas has future plans that are a bit more dark. She was angry when Nathanos let slip to Sarfang that she planned to hunt down Malfury and herself, making Sarfang, of course, suspicious that she was keeping him in the dark. We then have this Nathanos excerpt that makes her darker ambitions even more more clear. Too many in the Horde were short-sighted and weak-willed. Sylvanas had seen what lay beyond this life. She knew what waited on the other side. What else could she do but act on that knowledge? If her actions sometimes seem cruel, well, life is cruel. Existence was fleeting. Her plan soared over the horizon of mortality and frightened many. It did not frighten Nathanos. It delighted him. 
There's a big quote, and what can we make from all of this? Well, it makes it clear that she has a long-term goal and a pretty well-thought-out plan. Throughout this, she uses her subordinates effectively, being able to engage with them as individuals in order to best extract their value, like with Starfang. This is Sylvanas at her best, which begs the question, why would she later go on to do things that here she would not have approved of? Well, as established in episode one of this series, Sylvanas is not always performing at her best. Her patterns of behavior, they're always ruthless, but whether they are calculated or impulsive, that depends on her current emotional state. When her composure is maintained, she is calculating. However, when it's not, be that, you know, the pressure of the moment or coming under a severe emotional duress, that's when she is impulsive, with much of what she does being driven by her insecurities. How she tries to bury her emotional needs, you know, trying to keep up a brave face, you know, trying to mask her trust issues, when they're very clearly through reading all of the Sylvanas media there and present and affecting her constantly. Okay, let's get to the war. So, her and Sylvanas' war gets off to a really good start, but they do face stiff resistance and mounting losses, especially when Malfurion took to the field along with his wisps. Then affairs worsened when a night elf fleet appeared, having turned back from Silithus. Still, she was able to think on her feet, coming up with a plan that had her hunt Malfurion, her forces deal with the fleet, and Sarfang launch a flank attack through Felwood. However, it was in the execution of this plan that Sylvanas broke. While Sarfang and the Horde forces were successful in their mission, she was not. As was shown in-game, Malfurion had the upper hand on her. We know this from our in-game character's perspective. However, thankfully, the novella gives us Sarfangs. He came upon the battle without recognizing what it was, and upon seeing an enemy, he reflexively threw his axe, only to, after the axe was in the air, realize that it was Malfurion, and he instantly regretted what he would later call a dishonorable blow. Now, we never see this event from Sylvanas' point of view, but I think we can guess it pretty easily. By this stage, her plan hinged on her ability to defeat Malfurion. As we see in-game, that was clearly not happening, and Malfurion could have clearly ended her. Now, throughout this book, he is just a force to be reckoned with, one that inspires terror. Malfurion is completely ruthless. His subordinates are ruthless, even shocking Sylvanas at times. He would have ended her there, and she would have known that. And this absolutely would have conjured up her deep fear of death, what's driven her character. She would have been aware that also she would have failed. The plan would have failed because of her. So put these things together and you would have had a desperate, impulsive, and actually terrified Sylvanas. Of course, she would not tell anyone how she would feel, as we will very soon see. Sarfang's axe struck true, downing Malfurion and saving Sylvanas. She told him that he had done well. I think she was clearly thankful here, but of course she wouldn't admit that she was losing, as what she actually said was, I was having trouble finishing him. He was just wasting my time, which we know is a lie. She just will not admit that she needed the help, reinforcing that when you get down to it, she's quite insecure, and that no amount of clever planning or cold demeanor can really mask it as hard as she may try. And this is when she makes a crucial mistake, one that would come to define the battle for Azeroth. She congratulated Sarfang, told him that the kill was his, and then she left. Now, Sarfang, of course, did not finish off Malfurion. He hesitated for a long time before feeling a loon shine on him with hope, sorrow, and love, and that caused him to actually seize up. The bright light of a loon enveloped him. He fell to the ground and witnessed Taronda, who had finally arrived. And it is implied here that a loon had helped to stay his blade, something that Sylvanas later believes, as is told to us in a line that actually foreshadows current game content even beyond 8.3. Now, when Sylvanas found out that Malfurion escape, she was beyond furious, and she even contemplated ending Sarfang on the spot. She then walked off on her own, and here's the quote. She could imagine their expressions, Sarfang at peace, Nathano seething, but she did not want them to see hers, not until her rage had cooled. She needed to think. And this further reinforces that she is easily overwhelmed by emotions that she cannot control, and that she often will try to hide her true emotions from others, in this case, by just walking away. 
Now, with Taronda and Malfurion having survived, she rethought her plan. Now, she had convinced Sarfang of launching the war by telling him that Taronda would, in advocating for the recapture of Teldrassil, actually divide the alliance, especially because the Horde could then hold the city hostage. Now, we know that from what Nathanos let slip, that she had always wanted to hunt down Malfurion, so it seems like her goal was to kill Malfurion, hold Teldrassil hostage, and then use Taronda's fiery nature to split the alliance and to win. From her perspective, she just experienced a really traumatic time fighting Malfurion, actually being at the edge of death, and she believed that her plan had failed. Her response to this is rather telling. Here's the quote. Even in this dark hour, they would say, Elun still watches over us. And that was almost certainly true, wasn't it? Elune had intervened. Perhaps she had even stayed Sarfang's killing blow. And she wouldn't be the only force beyond the Alliance to oppose Sylvanas' true objective. Sylvanas' anger grew cold. She had known this would happen. It had simply come sooner than expected. That was all. So that's what Sylvanas thought. And that line, that last line, that's clearly just her still convincing herself that she's still in control. But it is overall a bleak picture, especially because she now believes that, yes, forces other than the Alliance are opposing her. Now, given this line and our most recent Toronto video, I think it's very clear what that force may be. Sylvanas thought back to their plan. A wound that cannot heal. That is what they wanted to inflict in the Alliance. Sylvanas needed to think of a new way to inflict one. There was no turning back. Now, by this stage, she is an emotional whirlwind. She's at her most impulsive. Her anger has turned cold. So she turns to Dalaran, a dying night elf commander. And this is when Warbringer Sylvanas occurs. She taunts Dalaran. And when this happens, over in the novella, we see Sarfang and Nathanos together plan their assault on the tree, making it very clear that at this stage, the Horde plan is to capture the tree and follow through with their goal of holding it hostage. This plan only changes, though, when Dalaran wounds Sylvanas emotionally, saying that she grieves for her, that she has made life her enemy and that she cannot kill Hope. And this is where Sylvanas turns cruel, shouting to burn Teldrassil in what the novella describes as being a, quote, white hot anger. Even the Thanos was confused, but of course he did carry out her orders against Sarfang's protests. Sarfang's admonishment of her actions, while he may not have intended it, actually brings up loads of Sylvanas' own arguments against what she just did. Things that we've covered in this video, like Sylvanas saying that destroying Teldrassil was both unthinkable and a surefire way to unite the Alliance against them. Now, she blames it all on Sarfang, saying that it was his plan and that, you know, he spared Malfurion, saying that, you know, he was her master strategist and that he had failed. She told Sarfang that the burning was his fault, that it was now her only way to destroy hope. Now, this, of course, was wrong, and even she would admit admit it as such if she was in her level-headed mode. But of course, she's not being level-headed. As we see here, she just refuses to externally admit any wrongdoing. She's that insecure. And well, you know, because of that, any like actual admission is the last thing she would do. Again, something born out of insecurity. Now, this was, in principle, a pretty decent story. The problem is that Blizzard told it across many different mediums in an incohesive manner. And this led to many people not understanding Sylvanas' decision-making how her impulsive, risky decisions have actually been established in her character. Now, I do blame Blizzard for this. I think if you choose to tell your story in a fragmented manner, you can't really blame people for not having a complete understanding of your story. So I would say that this is a pretty decent story, but just told poorly. Criticisms aside, though, we now have a comprehensive understanding of how Sylvanas responds to things, and how she now believes that forces beyond the Alliance are working against her. She has really made a right mess of her original plan, her original really quite good indeed plan, but, well, how it follows up is rather interesting. You see, once Sylvanas regains her composure, she then goes back to acting in a logical manner, attempting to use what she has to the best of her ability. So, the original plan to hold Teldrassil 
Cole hostage is shot. It's gone. And that makes an assault on Lordaeron inevitable. So she correctly decides that the right thing to do is to make the Alliance's inevitable victory as Peric as possible by employing the Blight and raising up her own forces. She knows that this will not win her allies amongst the Horde, and, uh, well, based on his reaction to Teldrassil, she knows that Sarfang is pretty much all but lost to her. Sylvanas flits really between anger and composure, snapping at subordinates, but generally executing a solid plan here. Even in the throne room confrontation, she displays none of the impulsiveness shown during the War of Thorns. Yes, she acts like a mustache-twirling villain, but that is literally what she is trying to show to the Alliance, because remember, with her larger plan, she wants as much war and death as is possible. Now, throughout this, she abuses Sarfang and leaves him behind. Now, you may think this is where she would be, like, hoping that he would lead a rebellion, resulting in more bloodshed, but that's clearly not the case, because she tries to assassinate him in patch 8.1, so clearly she is actually just still enraged over what happened during the War of Thorns, and is actually just being horrible to him. Really, it does seem like she just leaves him to die, and that her anger towards him is a blind spot, with her just not anticipating that the Alliance would actually show mercy and ultimately use him to win their war, which is a bit odd considering how she later wants the rebellion to happen, but of course in 8.1, literally tries to assassinate Sarfang and ensure there is no rebellion, so that's potentially a little bit of muddled storytelling because we don't have her point of view on it. I think what it does show us, though, is that she is the type to underestimate other people's emotions and their intelligence. She clearly is a narcissistic sociopath, so she likely doesn't think that really the respect shared between, say, you know, Sarfang and Varian might have led to Anduin, like, showing Sarfang mercy. But anyway, during that throne room confrontation, yeah, she comes off like a mustache twirling villain, as I said, and again, that's exactly what she wants them to think. She, you know, that she'll do anything, kill anyone. She wants Gen to be as angry at her as is possible, and this is what would make the Alliance desperate to take her down, and indeed, she does succeed there. Capability-wise, much of this is Sylvanas actually at her best. This is the same Sylvanas, I think, that came up with the original plan to take out the Alliance. All that's changed, though, are, well, a little bit of her goals. Basically, this is Sylvanas at her best, dealing with the ramifications of Sylvanas at her worst, and basically, it's this flip-flop that makes her such a strange character to follow, because she'll make an impulsive decision, only to then calm down and deal with the fallout as best she can. Thing is, though, every time she gets impulsive and snaps, that only leaves the path towards her goal being, well, significantly more brutal. So join me very soon in our final Sylvanas deep dive where we're going to delve into her actions during Battle for Azeroth and how, with us not having her inner monologue, she seems even more mysterious, more impulsive, and more disconnected from players, ultimately being a slightly confusing and less believable character. But with what we have, the foundations that we've laid in episode one and this episode, we we will be able to trace Sylvanas' path successfully forward, including her pact with Ashara and where she's likely going to be going after what we've currently seen in-game. So, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you very much for watching, and with that, I will see you next time.